Um, thank you all for coming and bringing us started. Uh, my name is Wayne Fyden, I'm planning director at Hampton. Um, I just want to go around to some introductions. Uh, I think it's sorry. I'm going to go around and do introductions, then I have sort of a brief presentation, then we'll get spend as much time as possible on the um, Carolyn Mish is from my office as well. She's going to be our note taker for the process. There's some city councilors that can introduce themselves. I'm Ryan O'Donnell, I'm the Ward 3 Council. Dave Murphy, Ward 5. Uh, Bill White, Council at Large. Um, so I'm just go around, everyone introduce yourselves. Just, I'm, I'm curious about where you live, how close you are to the site. Joe Bell, 18 School Street. Joe Cadet, uh, one street right outside the gate. Amy Rhodes on 36 Monroe Street. Julie Carose, 30 Monroe Street. Can you speak up? I'm, I'm Eric at 29 Monroe Street. Dale Melcher, 60 David Shearer, South Street. Dale Melcher, 61 Lyman. Okay. Dorothy Nemitz, 44 Monroe. Peg Keller, Housing and Community Development Staff here. <laughs> Richard Wagner, 48 Lyman. Ruth Fulton. 48 Lyman. Uh, Bill Dwight, 39 Myrtle. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows where it is. We know where it is. It's a Sicilian Bill, we know where it is. It's not even on satellite photos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sarah Sanders, 41 Lyman. Susan Lyman, 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 41 Georgiana Rubel, 15 Columbus. Kathy Bailey, 19 East Street. Jasper Lovejansky, 226 South Street. Kathy Lewis, Rebel, Adam. Bob Walker, 13 Fourth Street. Barry Worth, 27 Rebel. Jim Nash, 18 Montview. Libby Arnie, 11 Fourth Street. Denise McConnell, Day Avenue. Alex Rafa, 38 Street. Eric Stover, where are you at? And a frequent trespasser. Anna Dana Bush, 54 Columbus Avenue. Seven Grace, 46 Columbus. David will complain about the trespassers. Yeah, <laughs> I'm David Desward, I'm the Smith College representative. <laughs> I'm Bob Reckon with a 36 Street. Okay. Um, whoever came in late. I'm Lawson Wilson of 244 South Street. Jonathan Hart, 58 Lyman Road. So um, I just want to talk about the site a little bit. Um, so there's been a lot of, I know there's a lot of neighborhood concern about what happens on the site. David can comment on Smith College uh, and their perspective on the site. But you know, just to be clear, obviously the city doesn't own the property. It's our understanding that Smith is at some point going to sell the site. I don't know a time schedule. You can add it if you know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, at this point, I, I can't see anything really happening before one and a half to three years out. I mean, okay. we're, we're talking, you know, a little bit down the road here. So background of this from our standpoint was, to correct me if I'm wrong, but about three years ago, Smith did an announcement said they want to shrink the physical footprint of the campus. There's been a lot of attention on them surplusing parts of the campus behind Helen Hills Hills Chapel um, because that area has buildings and so obviously there's a lot of interest in those buildings get reused. Fort Hill was sort of part of the area which they're probably going to surplus at some point. Our understanding is probably keep the preschool and sell the rest of the campus. Um, and so about a year and a half ago we approached Ruth Constantine as the Vice President for Finance and said you know we'd love to work with you and sort of think about what the future of the site would be. Ruth gave, gave us a tour of the site and walked around looking at opportunities. And they said, but we're in the process of going through and hiring a new president. We guarantee you absolutely nothing's going to happen for a year and a half while we go through that process. And so we put off the planning process to the new president who's on board. Um, so we're starting the process up again. The fact that we're looking at this doesn't have, isn't a representation of what Smith is or isn't doing. We, we know they're going to sell it at some point. From the city standpoint, we want to be ready and, and, for knowing it's going to be sold, but we're not in the driver's seat for this process. Um, and to a large extent, Smith College is not in the driver's seat for this process. They'll be selling it to someone who buys it, and they'll be looking at the city regulations and going forward for that process. So we just sort of want to understand, you know, what are the options that are out there? 
get neighborhood input so you understand what the options that are out there and think about what, if any, regulatory changes we need to make to, to address that. So the conversation today is, is based on, on all of those things. Um, Pardon me. Should yeah. we mention that it's being taped just for Oh, yeah, purposes? thank you. So you are being taped for both voice and audio. Um, Sorry. Okay. So you all know the site better than I do. I used to live in Ravel Ave, so I you know, used to also trespass on the property as well. My dog knows it really well. Um, but you know, we just try to figure out what are some of the, the we call them character finding features? One of the things that are really important about the property that you might want to reflect, or not only the property, but the whole neighborhood, that we might want to make sure any new development reflects in some of those things. So one thing that's, that's clear, and obviously a lot of your neighborhood is cut off here, is one of the things that makes the neighborhood really strong is that you have this street grid that interconnects. You can walk from street to street. Um, but what's nice is even though the, the neighborhood, even though you can in theory drive through the neighborhood, there's not a lot of places to go. So the ability to walk through the street and so you, don't, you can walk downtown without going out to South Street, but you don't have a lot of through traffic. So interconnecting neighborhoods, so it's not you know, a lot of dead ends, but not a lot of traffic. Um, obviously the trails that, it, that we all trespass on, that Smith doesn't seem to complain about us all trespassing, is an important feature of the site and, and serves the neighborhood. And then obviously the connection to Dale. Um, so it's interesting actually asking people, but somewhere around Monroe, maybe a little bit further south, is sort of the point that people make most of their trips to downtown or on foot, and then people who live a little bit further south make most of their, foot, their trips to downtown by car, but some on foot. Um, but you know, this area we're talking about is the area where we think the majority of trips downtown are on foot. Obviously, probably less so today and more so in Um and then, you know, one of the things great of this neighborhood is all your homes or most of your homes are really focused on the street. So that, you know, if you walk along the street, you know, if I walk my dog at night when I live there or my child is a baby and walk around, you get a real sense of, you know, you can gaze in people's windows and see the character of the neighborhood and you feel like all the homes contribute to that overall street. Um, and then, you know, obviously the open space that's there. So you actually have, you're, you're one of the denser neighborhoods in the city. Um, so there's a lot of density, a lot of housing units. Um, I don't know the exact mix, but obviously a lot of these are single family homes, but there's a lot of multi families as well. Um, and there's not any parks in the neighborhood per se, but you're really ringed with open space, particularly in the meadows. You know, obviously to some extent right now, Lyman State's been serving that function, uh, Veterans Field as well. Um, so dense housing with easy access to the open space. Um, and then the mix of housing types of so um, with that, we sort of looked at the site and said, okay, you know, what's gonna go on out here? Again, the land will be developed privately. You know, whoever Smith sells the property to is gonna come up with a proposal and go through the, the entitlement process, go through the permitting process for it. Um, they, need to get, they need to comply with city zoning, they need to comply with city subdivisions, um, and so the city has some say in how development occurs, even though it's mostly gonna be private. The city spent about four or five years just adopting new zoning for all the urban areas around downtown for around 70% of the population of the city, somewhere around there? Yeah, a little bit. Um, for certainly the majority of the city's population. And my guess is that zoning that's there isn't going to change dramatically given such a long process to get there. But what city council did in approving the zoning is they said, we're going to have a moratorium on projects that are seven or more units between last summer when they adopted it and July 1st. And what our hope is between now and July 1st is to adopt what are the specific criteria for those projects. So if we do nothing on July 1st, anyone can apply for a permit before the planning board for projects that are seven or more units. And it's a little bit scary, I think, if, it, if we did nothing to everybody. Developers don't know what the rules are, they don't know if they'll be approved or not approved, and neighborhoods don't know what the rules are, they don't know if they'll be approved or not approved. So we think the strongest criteria we have to shape development for these larger projects is to think about what these special permit criteria are. So what, when, the plan, when someone applies for a project to do seven units or 70 units, what are the criteria the planning board applies when they look at these projects? Um, and so we can talk about anything else you want this evening as well, but at least from staff's initial review, that's what we think is sort of the most constructive opportunity to think about those things. Um, and so with that in mind, we sort of went through and looked, you know, what are the different ways the land could be developed?
So one scenario is, is someone could build a road up from Fruit Street. Um, no developer's gonna wanna do that, because that's gonna be a very expensive option. The grade's too steep, so they have to do some regrading. Um, I don't think you're all gonna jump up and down today and say, please, 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 come in from Fruit Street. But you know, it's one of the options that everyone's gonna look at. Um, and so we wanted to put it up there as, as one of the scenarios. Um, the other scenario is someone would do a looped road, that they would come in from South Street, they'd come in from Lyman, probably on the curve here. They'd have a road that comes in and loops around and hit a dead end street. The issue from a developer standpoint is we don't allow dead end streets that are more than 500 feet long. So from a developer standpoint, they want to loop two places and then loop around here so that their 500 feet only starts over here. Um, the disadvantage from a developer standpoint is you're paying a lot of money for roads. So that's one scenario a developer might, might look at. This would be sort of the option for the greatest number of single and two family ho ha homes. Um, another scenario is a developer would do a shorter road. I, I'm like, I'm back. One of the disadvantages for this sort of scenario is the only way you can really justify the roads is if you do a row of homes here, a row of homes here, here, and here. And the site's very tight when you get there, and so a developer may say it's, it's not worth the infrastructure. If you just did a single road, and these are all, you know, take these drawings with, sort of think of them as crayon drawings. These aren't designed to be engineered drawings. Um, but if you didn't do a loop road, you'd get less development on the site, um, a smaller footprint on the site, but it doesn't necessarily mean fewer units, because if you're doing a shorter road, there might be incentive to do sort of a larger apartment complex or condominium complex instead of single family homes or two family homes. Um, and then we sort of looked at other scenarios, you know, where are the places which we probably want there to be open space. You all probably know this, the site's about um, 31 acres, of which about 15 acres is buildable. So there's 15 acres of land which really can't get built on. This area that's down here, this parcel of floodplain is very steep. This area over here that's steep and has some wetlands over here. So you can imagine most of those areas would be preserved regardless of the developer wants. I think our, our regulations would allow development there. Um, but there's a difference between is this open space that's park-like and available to the public, or is it someone having a big estate lot who owns the property? Um, and then this is just sort of a marker, but one of the things we've played with is saying, well, <coughs> larger projects should have some sort of park land. And it's not about size. Um, so you think about urban parks, where sometimes a tiny park is incredibly valuable. So we're sort of, so this is a marker, we're just going to be somewhere totally different. But the idea is there should be some spot that serves as a focal point. You know, we were just sort of that. So. And then we played with, what we did literally is we took all your homes down here, and we made a Xerox copy, and we cut them out and pasted them over here. Very high tech. Um, <laughs> but just sort of to play with saying, if you're trying to mimic what the existing neighborhood is, um, how would this work? Um, you know, roads coming here. Again, some of these homes face the wrong direction. This was really just to help us think about what are the scenarios, how many homes could really be over here. So this is sort of one potential development scenario that comes out of it. Again, a developer might not love this because it requires the most amount of expensive roads, but we were sort of thinking what we've heard so far, at least from past planning processes, is people like new developments to match the existing neighborhood. And this would sort of match the neighborhood short of tearing down a home and lying to connect there. You know, this is sort of the, the way you can match the neighborhood there. Um, and so we just play this is the same thing, just zoomed in so you can see a little better. But uh, again, imagining that wherever there's green space, you probably want some sort of linkage for trails, some way, some way to get down there. Um, I should go back to this slide. Um, there's a roundabout being designed right here for the intersection of Pleasant Street and Conn Street. And as part of that project, the state is planning to extend sidewalks all the way up to the dike and a little bit beyond the dike. So this creates an opportunity for open space so we can come back here to create this. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to get in this process is, you know, if we're trying to match the neighborhood, um, how do we think about lots that, that look a lot like your lots do in terms of frontage along the street and depth for doing it? Um, the focus, for, you know, you're, notice when I'm going through these slides, we haven't talked about the number of units whatsoever because we really focus this more on trying to match the form of the neighborhood. How, does, how do new buildings look like your existing buildings? Whether they're one family homes, two family homes, whether they're like the, the uh, townhouses on, on Lyman. Um, and so this, this scenario I talked about sort of helps us match the neighborhood in that sense. 
Um, <coughs> developer would make the most amount of money per lot, which would make it attractive to the developer, because um, those lots would all be valuable lots. Um, it would allow the project to be phased. That is one of the problems in Northampton, is even a project which would totally pencil out, which makes sense to develop, is hard because you may only sell four homes, five homes a year. Um, and so it's hard to spend a million dollars in roads when you're, you know, you're paying too much for interest to the bank. So a lot of times developers want a project that they can develop over a number of years for doing it. And so that, you know, a single family, two family, three home, three family homes <coughs> use that. Um, and as I said, that the scenario I showed has the most expensive road construction. So then you can imagine any number of alternatives we didn't sketch out, but all the alternatives probably mean less roads, so it might mean more non-developed land, but it probably means less public non-developed land. So you, you're more likely to get sort of an apartment or you know a, a larger condo project. Um, I think the market for those things are very limited. So I don't imagine someone wanting to build a condo project with you know some large number of units. Um, but the less they spread out, the more you see someone looking at that alternatives out there. Um, so then we play just a little bit, and, I, and I'm almost done with this. So because most of this time is for you all to talk. But we play with what would this actually mean as we looked at regulatory criteria. So I, I said in the beginning. I think the strongest tool here is what are the criteria which we could have for special permits? And so you can imagine these sorts of criteria. So one is we either want sidewalks to match most of the neighborhood, um, and probably in our case, sidewalks on both sides of the street. Or the other area we're beginning to play with in some places in town is what's called shared streets, where what's happened is over the years, you know, many of us were kids and lived in neighborhoods without sidewalks, and then cars drove faster and faster, we got more and more scared. So we put up barriers to stop the, the cars, and then we put sidewalks in. The other scenario is going back to streets that you can drive very slowly on. Streets where you go 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, and it's safe for people to walk on the streets themselves. So one of the, one of the other extreme, so, you know, streets with sidewalks or very narrow streets really physically designed to constrain, constrain the speed of traffic. Um, connecting the streets I've mentioned, avoiding dead ends is already a city standard, um, but when we have dead ends, Thinking about are there trails from the end of those dead ends to go to open space, to go to Food Street, to go to you know wherever we connect, um, and then sort of maximizing those bicycle and pedestrian connections. Um, and then this other part is probably looser in our mind, but thinking about what does it mean to regulate the form itself. Um, I think the discussion we've had in the last four years is there's not a lot of interest in doing detailed design standards, that is to tell people what their homes have to look like but there might be a lot of interest. We already have some of this in the books, and maybe there's interest in more, in terms of things like, you know, focusing on setbacks so the neighborhood matches together, focusing on articulation of buildings, so that if you have, you're facing the side of someone's building, you know, it's not, and it goes back 50 feet, that there's some bend in the building, you know, so it creates some things of interest. Um, and then the park is a focal point I mentioned as well, as, you know, some way to make sure that, you know, that the area becomes alive and attractive for people who live there as well as the neighborhood. So that's sort of the background. Um, the rest of the time is really for you. I want to start first by questions, so not leading questions, just real questions you have, then you get lots of times for, for input. So any questions either for me or for Smith or anybody else? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is not a question, but it's a comment from somebody who's not here. Right, I want to wait for questions first, then we can do that next. I gotta leave shortly. Okay. Two um, buildings there that one is not being used where the old school was and then the carriage house. Yeah. Is there any possibility of those being um, defined as historic buildings or protected? Well, they are historic buildings. Okay. Um, so if there was federal money involved, because the federal government looks at buildings that are eligible for list in the National Register, they would certainly look at those buildings and say, could they be preserved? Um, to do a local historic district tends to be the city council and sort of most historic people say it should tell a story. The neighborhood wants to be part of the historic district. So my guess is city council would happily do it not without speaking for city council. To just do two private properties and not regulate ourselves who live next door might be harder for doing it. Certainly when we're playing with a property, we sort of assume there's an interest in saving those buildings, the Lyman estate, I have no idea of the condition of it, whether it's salvageable or not. Dimension. Other question? Dimension, yeah. Mm. Other questions? Do you know roughly how many new homes were built in the city in the last year or two? Harold, do you know? 
Be before um, the recession, we were about 45 yeah. or 50 a year. Yeah, I think um, it's well below that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. It's coming back up. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it bottomed out about 10 or 15 years a year, but I don't know what. So it's somewhere between 15 and 45. Uh, Wayne, I know with the new zoning, uh, of course, it's for more density potentially. What is the, the actual maximum density with the usable space that you could foresee? We haven't calculated it. It's too hard to do because it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, you know, the most you could get, you could imagine, is apartments. You know, if you build one apartment block that was huge, you'd get a really big number. By the time you start taking away streets and wetlands, I don't know, it's a much smaller number, and, and that's a hard assessment to do until we know, I mean, I did a crayon drawing, until you really know where the wetlands are and really know where the slopes are and that kind of thing. I don't really know what the assessment. You know, what we did do is we sort of did it backwards. You know, we looked at this thing and added up the number of lots that were here. Um, and I think, don't quote me because I'm not exactly sure, but it was about 50 lots that were here in this area. But you can see like this, because again, we cut out of the buildings. This is this four unit building right over here. Right. Um, and uh, most of these are single family homes. So what that means for units, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's frankly probably a more realistic alternative for how someone would get to the maximum units than the maximum the zoning allows per se. Yeah. Thank you. It's a question for, is it Dave from Smith? Yes. Dave, um, has there been any thought at this point as to how the college is going to approach selling this? Uh, so, so our approach today, and, and not a lot of thought has gone into it specifically yet, is really to sell it as is. Um, that, that would be our position, other than retaining the, the, the child care site, the existing child care site, we would plan to sell the remainder of the property as is, but that's into a developer or exactly the highest would, yeah exactly exactly highest the best use type situation we would go out and market the property so the housing too you would sell the housing uh, the units up front yes yeah. yes is that's not shown up there. you mean up front on south street yes yeah, the faculty right. housing exactly right that's what you don't Staff see them here because at least right. for our scenario we sort of assumed there wasn't a lot of value frankly so we just you know, drew on top of them. Was there 16 <laughs> units there? Uh, total on site, uh, I want to say, is about 12 units. Okay. That includes a, a house that's back uh, further on the property uh, from South Street. Right. Uh, Wayne, I was just wondering if you could describe um, any traffic studies that might be triggered by future development, if any, just because I think traffic is one of the major concerns here. Um, I'm, I'm a new guy, so I have to ask these basic questions. Yeah, I mean, any development here would require a traffic analysis, um, and we want to understand. We typically go by you know what's called level of service at intersections, so we want to make sure the level the level of service at intersections still works. Um, so they they have to that sort of thing. When I went back to mention the thing about Fruit Street as a connection, you could imagine that would be the only reason a developer would ever want to go to Fruit Street is if the level of service would be so bad just going off South Street that they'd want to look at Fruit Street. And I don't think the numbers would work for that. So a, a city traffic study would precede development? A developer would have to include a traffic yeah, study okay. as part of the process. Uh -huh. So we assume, um, we assume 10 units, 10, 10 trips per zone? So to the, the nationwide figure is typically about 10 trips, per, 10 one-way trips per dwelling unit. So each of your homes generates 10 one-way trips. It includes the trips that you do and your kids do and your share of the... Per day. Per day. A day. <laughs> so then what developers do is they start saying, what's different about this site? So the fact it's closer to downtown and more trips are on foot would hopefully reduce the number. This is part of the reason for this, the big zoning change that we just went through is because it is disgusting. Because the average suburban home is generating 10 point something <coughs> trips per day. One-way trips, so five round trips. Um, trips closer to downtown generate somewhat less. I can't say it's dramatically less, but it's somewhat less. So developers are looking at those things, and then, uh, you know, in terms of Ryan's question, you look at those numbers, what are the times they're likely to be out the street, what's, you know, what streets are close to capacity, what improvements are needed to do? Yeah, I have a question for Smith. In your um, calculus for a, an offer, somebody offers you money for this land, how, what do you look at? Do you look at the P, any PR value with the city of who this person might be? Do you look at their background? Uh, I mean, I think we would assess any, any purchaser uh, based on their, you know, mostly their ability to fund the project primarily. But yeah, we, we would consider probably 
uh, what type of developer they are during our process when we go out to bid, essentially. No Donald Trumps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like it. Or how, what, how they would <coughs> improve the city. So, would you look at that? Would you consider how with, how your sale would lead the city in 10 years? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that, I, I can't speak for historically, I don't know that we haven't done this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, has been a criteria by which we've assessed uh, purchasers or other properties. Of course, the types of properties we've sold historically have been more just smaller residential type properties. Uh, something of this scale is a little bit new. Uh, Dave? Yep. Uh, do you think Smith would consider parceling off the old Lyman mansion and the carriage house as separate properties since they kind of front are very close to Lyman and not in terms include of not them in the whole development? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what the, the, the necessary benefit would be of that situation. Um, well, you know, I think the benefit would be that some developer doesn't come in and bulldoze them. Right, right, but you know, I mean, Lyman, and, and I think Wayne reference is actually on the, the inside, and I, and I was just in there recently, not in terrible shape. Um, and, and, you know, and, and certainly I'm not a developer, uh, but I could envision a developer potentially, you know, wanting to do a, some type of adaptive reuse of that uh, for um, likely some type of, you know, multifamily housing but, or something along those yeah, lines. But typically a developer who would develop a property that size would not want to manage to reusing a, pro yeah. a property like that it wouldn't be in the same kind of scope of work and i think that those properties would warrant themselves more to private development mm -hmm. yeah we have i mean we haven't given it enough uh, that much thought to think about carving off individual pieces of it uh in the same line of thinking would smith um, put any weight or emphasis on a developer who is going to retain those buildings uh, I, not necessarily, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, I, again, we would uh, uh, assess it in terms of, you know, uh, our, our plans for the site and, and ultimately the the the, uh, the value of the site to the college. I, I don't necessarily know that we would weight that more heavily. As a follow up that, to that, Dave, uh, there's 13 buildable acres on that site. Is that correct? 15. 15. Yeah, three shares over here. Yeah. So would the college uh, consider perhaps giving, or that was maybe heresy, but maybe giving a portion of that land to the city, keeping it out of what souls are developer? Yeah, you know, I mean, I like it. I mean, you, you have to think of it, you know, from, from Smith's point of view. You know, we, we're going to look at this site and, and ultimately, we need to sell this site to help support our mission and support our students. So we would absolutely consider that. But I think it's more the planning process that might dictate the, the type of open space um, that would ultimately be on the site. My follow up, David, to all those questions uh, would be, would you folks consider the possibility of doing an RFP with regards to protections for the neighborhood, or at least some? Well, well again, I, I think those types of things would be defined through the sale, or sorry, through the development process and through the regulatory process. Right, I, mean, I, I don't have a word in Smith's mouth, and I'm obviously not speaking for Smith, but every nonprofit in the world is going to tell you that they have a fiduciary responsibility to whatever they exist for. Um, so the goal, I, I always think it's great for nonprofits to do good things, and I'm not trying to suggest that it's not true, but I think the goal in a process is how is the best return that Smith will get be the thing that serve the neighbors. Right. So that, you know, yeah. clearly the developer knows that, that a requirement of a permit is to connect a trail through there. <coughs> then we're going to get that and Smith isn't giving, leaving something on the table. So we're trying to find sort of that win-win that for everybody. Right. And just to, just to add to that, I mean, we're likely to remain, uh, you know, neighbors there as well by retaining. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're going to be very concerned about what's going on in and around the property. And, and, and ultimately, I think a, a process and exercise like this helps to provide you know, the type of clarity that, that we're hoping for in the long term. I know Ruth had mentioned that when we sat, that, yeah. that, but it was also that potentially, you, if the offer was right, you might not save the school. So if you did, right. I, I, yeah. that yeah. sounds much nicer. But. I mean, it basically, someone would need to, to pay us enough for us to relocate that facility somewhere else and rebuild it. Mm. So, uh, which I don't think would be right. too inexpensive. Yeah, that's legit. Yeah. Derek? I was actually going to take them off the hot seat by kind of pointing out the judiciary. They, they have to, if they sell the property, they have to sell it for top dollar. Otherwise, they get in trouble with their trustees and with the IRS. And 
rest of it. But what they could do is carve off a piece of property and donate it. Um, that's a very doable thing. They can't sell it for less than it's worth, but they can donate it. And there's certainly value in that. And Smith, another kind of <laughs> Smith already has a development agreement with the city that as they take down units in the West Street area, um, that they have to provide replacement affordable housing in Northampton. So this could be a site where they carve out some of those units that's, that's out there. Um, more on the live estate. Um, so I, I, I missed the first 15 minutes of this, so I don't know if you talked about timeline. But what was the general the In terms of, I, I really can't see, I mean, based on the economy, based on where we are right now, I, I can't see us going out for sale. I mean, and this is without a lot of conversations about this, any sooner than a year and a half to three years at the very earliest. Okay, so I, I actually um, had the fortune of um, visiting the carriage house today and being on the inside and experiencing an active leak in the carriage house. So my question is, there's a higher probability that those buildings will be interesting to a new developer if the roofs are maintained. And you know, and if just the basic structure is maintained. Is Smith willing in the next few years before it sells to put some basic repair into those two buildings so that there are not active leaks? Because I've been in both of them and I've seen active leaks in both of them. Yeah, I, 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 again, I was in the estate house recently and I, and I know we, we at least maintain that to, to a minimum standard so that it, it can be retained for a, a future use potentially. I'm not sure what you're talking about in terms of active leaks, but you know, we, we try to, we, we're still using those spaces to some degree, um, you know, albeit for storage largely right now. So we do want to maintain it for that activity. And we, you know, we invest as needed to support those activities. Check with your people. Yeah. The, the roofs are so leaking. This is in the carriage house? Carriage house and, yeah. and in the main house. Okay. So any more questions before we move on to sort of character defining features? Yeah. I'm just wondering how, how, you know, the, the non-buildable space gets zoned. So if someone buys the entire property, but then there's these 15 acres that aren't developed, do they get, are they part of, you know, an adjoining house, you know, that backs up into that land? Does that become, you know, like a, a two acre house property or does that get preserved somehow as open space that's made by the developer or right, how, how right. does that work? Good question, I don't know the answer. It really depends on the details of how a project goes forward. So many times in development, a developer carves off some land, maybe it's owned by the homeowner association, maybe it's given to the city, maybe it's given to a nonprofit to keep his open space. I would say that's by far the most common scenario we've, we've seen in the last 20 years. Sometimes <coughs> developers want to keep land for, for bigger lots, and so it really depends on, on what they're doing for the project. Um, so those could potentially get carved up into individual private ownership, those 15 acres. Like potentially only, only one part of it is buildable for a house, but the owner might own a couple more acres right. beyond That's it. not the most likely scenario, but potentially it is, and, and I think Thing, when we get into sort of asking you all for input on character finding features, that's the kind of thing we're looking for. <coughs> is is it good enough just to be open space, or do we want to make sure it's public access? And then if it stays as open space, then who owns it? Right. Again, you know, those have been often home by homeowner associations okay. and often by the public. So state hospital, for example, the developer is keeping all the parks within the state hospital that's owned by the homeowner association, yeah. and all the edges of the at, around the project are eventually going to be transferred to the city. In most of the subdivisions in town, which are more rural, that's been a similar pattern. The city doesn't necessarily want to own a small lot right in the middle. You know, if this was open space, for example, here and here, those would probably fit the targets of open space the city's often interested in. If there was a tiny little park here that served the neighborhood, it's a higher maintenance thing. That's usually the kind of thing we want home association to do. Um, at least that's our normal pattern for doing it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I and late. Um, is that lot in one zoning, or does it cross from one zoning area to another zoning area, and is it abutting the neighborhood, or is it more like Con Street? And um, what so I'm getting at is, what is the height restriction? Could we see another Walter Salvo height there, or is it going to be more friendly to the residential height? So all of this area up here, basically all the plateau, um, is on urban residential C. Um, this area down here is basically floodplain zoned accordingly as floodplain. So this is all one district? 
Karen, I don't know what the height is for you or something. Um, I think it's 50 feet. Okay. Say again. 50, 50 five, zero. Five, zero, five, zero, or? Yeah. Again, that would require a special, you know, a project like that would require a special permit. That's one of the things where we should be talking about how those things fit. Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at um, the imaginary layout here. Um, it looks to me like, you know, there's a high plateau and then you kind of slope down and there's a second plateau before you get down. So it looks like that part would be developed, part of that. Who knows? We, we did this as sort of, you know, where someone would do a loop at 500 feet out. So again, this is just sort of to illustrate points. So this is, you know, no idea of what a developer actually wanted to. And then uh, again, I must, might have missed this part, but knowing that all of that below is wetlands, and that the build out up against that wetlands on the lower side, for example, the senior center is closest within ten feet of wetlands. I remember because I was involved in the whole ordinance to change the, you know, the distance that was allowable within urban residential mm -hmm. for. For, um, for wetlands encroachment. And so I remember the senior center super, super close. So there's really very little wiggle room there. So I'm just curious to know what the city's plan is to manage those wetlands and to manage the tremendous amount of um, water flow that's gonna come off all of that development. Yeah, that's a big one. So water flow is sort of one of those, you know, sort of like traffic, what Ryan was asking about. Water flow is one of the things the developer has to show in a process that shows no increase in, in peak flow. So the, the, certainly when you get when you develop a site, more water leaves the site than before you develop it. But at least during peak times, the times we worry about flooding, that's one of the things the developer has to prove is that they're not going to do that. They're not going to impact the there. Wetlands themselves are sort of easier in this site because it's that defined plateau. So there's wetlands here. Some of this is wetlands. All of this is floodplain. But there's some distance between them. So <coughs> this is going to have a much greater buffer than, for example, the senior center out there. But this, the stormwater flow is certainly an issue that have to be part of the assessment. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the developable parcel is URC? That's correct. And there's a, you mentioned earlier, there's some, a moratorium until July? For anything that's over seven units, uh -huh. which obviously a project here would be, there's a moratorium until July 1st. Okay. And so a developer can't do a pro can't apply for a permit between now and July 1st for a larger project. Again, in this case, that doesn't matter because Smith isn't anywhere close to doing it. The more important part from our standpoint is we want to write the standards so when the planning board considers those projects at some point in the future, we all know what they're based on. The standards aren't written yet, is what you're saying. So we have general standards for every special permit in the city that include things like don't harm traffic, don't harm stormwater, fit the character of the neighborhood, but they're very nebulous, um, and they don't give a lot of direction. So yes, we have these base criteria already. We'd like to have more detailed criteria to help both neighborhoods and developers understand what the rules would be. So it would behoove us to, to get involved in that. That's right. Yep. Yeah. 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 I was just trying to get your head <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I have several questions, one for Smith and some timeline questions. So is it your sense that Smith will sell the parcel as a whole to a single developer? That, that would be our sense. I mean, you know, to some degree it will be dependent upon the types of reaction we get once we market the, market the parcel. Um, but that, that, that would be, that was, I think that's what we would envision right now. So um, you... I don't know how you go about marketing, but when you begin that, um, how, did, how do we all find out about that? For example, Susan has some information about uh, boomers wanting pocket neighborhoods. Pocket neighborhoods, you know, something I think about in my large home online. And, but the idea that I could pull enough people together to develop that entire space is a little daunting, but possibly some part of that space. So. I'm just curious about whether it's only going to market it as an entire parcel or whether you would entertain some other ideas and what the time frame of that might be. Well, I mean, I, I think we certainly have to be, you know, obviously very public about the fact that we are marketing it, marketing it because we have tenants on site, so they're going to want to know certainly that, that uh, we're selling the property. So, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it would be a very public thing. I'm not sure exactly how we would go out to, to you know, to advertise this, but. Uh, it's something that would ultimately be public, and I'm sure people can make proposals and approach, uh, you know, folks in my office, folks in Ruth Constantine's office, to make suggestions. And then I have a question, Wayne, for the city, which is, 
all of these impacts, environmental impact, traffic impact, which is huge. It's just huge with the development of Hospital Hill. And to add something like this is just mind-boggling. Impact on schools, on whatever. Um, how does that work once a developer does his or her own study? What's, what's the ability to respond? What's the time frame? So like the process typically is we get developers to do as much work as possible. <laughs> the city then assesses those and planning board, first the city staff <coughs> comments on the reports and says, this report's great, we believe it, this report is less than great, and we don't necessarily believe it. Um, and so we make recommendations to the planning board. Ultimately the planning board can accept the report, you know, get any input from staff, or planning board has the right to do their own report and charge the developer for it. There's a, a, a detailed process. They have to give the developer a chance to correct the report before we can spend their money. They have to warn them. We have to submit. So it's not as cut and dry, but we certainly have the right to do an independent assessment. Our planning board has the right to do independent assessment if a series of steps. And those are all open meetings. That's correct. We can all come to that. And then our, finally, are there city requirements about um, um, mixed income housing? A development like There's not city requirements per se, no. Um, we have some incentives in various areas. So, subdivision, you know, I mentioned this 500 foot street to end requirement. Um, we have an incentive in zoning that says if you want to go beyond 500 feet, you can only do that if you're providing, I think it's 11 or 12 percent affordable housing. We have a few things like that elsewhere. Developers sometimes take advantage of those incentives and sometimes don't. Thank you. David, I was wondering if um, you know what the property is valued at? Uh, not at all, no. We have not gotten any kind of valuation on the property. And, and I would just a caution, the city's assessor data is online, so you can go right. home and look right. it up. Right. But we're very careful about assessing your houses correctly because you pay taxes. Because Smith is exempt from taxes, there's less research going on those numbers. So you can look up the number, but know to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, because it's just, we don't Yeah, this is, for Smith, um, just a while ago, I think I heard you say when you were talking about how Smith would approach the sale of the property that you would be looking for highest price and best use. Um, so I'm wondering if Smith will have a defined process for defining what the parameters of best use are and whether or not there would be community input into that definition of best use. Well, I, mean, I, I think that's largely dictated by the, the city process. So you Yeah, exactly. By the zoning of the property and then ultimately the regulatory process that any developer would go through. But what I've seen in Northampton and elsewhere um, is this sort of two scenarios large institutions do. One is they say, we're not in the development business. We just want to sell it all to somebody else who has their own expertise. They may then look for partners or not. Um, the other is sometimes institutions hire a consultant to say, well, maybe this property is more valuable if we break it up into different pieces. <coughs> that, using Bob's comment, the Lyman estate is worth X dollars by itself and less than X if it's together. And so some institutions do that. And it really depends on their comfort with understanding you know, how to get the biggest value out of it. There was a, uh, we brought up in one of the neighborhood meetings we've had about possibly seeking a, uh, a a friendly developer that that would work with the neighborhood. Would you folks be uh, okay with that? Would you folks have uh, feel that that would be against um, your best well, interest? I, I just think that any developer that develops this is is going to have to work with the neighborhood to to get this project done. So I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how something like that would work. But but again, I you know, I think that would have to be a prerequisite. But yeah, I mean, it, let me add to that. Again, in terms of examples that, that we've been involved with, one of the biggest things that scares the developer is a project going to court and being in court for years. Mm -hmm. um, and so developers were some, I mean, you see, the, you see a range of developers. There's some developers who really want to work the neighborhood and they have, they break, break together and they're best of buddies and some developers who don't work in the neighborhood whatsoever. Um, and that because, you know, and obviously part of that's on the neighborhood. We've seen some neighborhoods who say, we don't want anything anytime and then they don't work well with developers in some neighborhoods who's, who get, they can influence the process by being involved. Um, yeah, so my question is back to regarding the developer leaving some of the, some of the space and potentially donating, donating it to the city, the open space. What financial incentive does a developer have to give away some of the land? Why would they do that? 
So a bunch of different ways. One is um, you can put strong incentives in zoning. And probably the biggest thing is we do is incentives in zoning that makes it worth the developer's while. I mean, first, remember there's no development value here to speak of. And there's really no development value here to speak of. Um, and so many developers just are happy to get rid of that land. Um, and then the other thing is you sort of think about, you know, what are the incentives in the zoning and what are you, you know, developers trying to get to yes. And so there's both what does the zoning say and then working with the neighbor through a series of meetings, developers might say this should be, you know, one of the scenarios we play with, like Joseph had one of the things that he played with is, should there be a buffer over here between the project and the homes over here? That's the sort of thing that usually works out later in a development process. I don't think we'd write zoning there, but it could well be a developer. You know, we, the city's done some limited development projects ourselves. Mm -hmm. where, uh, this would be too big for us, but we've done projects where properties on the market, we want to carve out some open space, we want to carve out some affordable housing, um, and the city ends up being the, the applicant. Um, and our rule, when we've played that role, is we only do it when the neighborhood wants us to be there. When the neighborhood agrees to come to the planning board and say, I really want this project um, for doing it. Some private developers take the same approach. They say, you know, the value of going through the planning board in one night instead of in two years is pretty valuable. Uh, and so they're willing to work with the neighbor now. And again, I, I wish I could say all are like that. It's a, it's a, a value to We see some developers who would give away some money up front for easy permitting, and some developers who just will fight the process because they think it's more valuable. Than <coughs> um, I want to step back a little bit and ask a question about what kind of capacity do we already have in, Northam in the city of Northampton for um, elderly and um, folks for whom being really close to downtown would be really important in terms of their quality of life and being able to, to live in town. Do we have enough of that housing? Do we need more of that housing? I, I think we need more of all housing close to downtown. Elderly certainly being part of it. We have public housing close to downtown that's focused on elderly. We have high-end private units, but we don't really have any congregate living downtown that's not public housing. Right? We have some of them. <coughs> Thanks. So from many years of walking my dog here, there are some incredibly old trees that are, you know, priceless. And so I don't know if there's any any way you can preserve some of the really, you know, phenomenal, beautiful old trees there. Yeah, that's a good point. Typically those are sort of weighing, you know, some things are easy to say, you have to do this and you can't do this. A lot of things are sort of weighing processes to say, you should save specimen trees as much as possible, but sometimes one specimen tree might make 40 acres unusable and it's not doable. And so there's okay. usually a balancing act, but it's often one of the things that gets looked at. Okay. Um, Would that be something where the botanic garden can you speak would up have up an opportunity to weigh in? With what, I'm sorry? Since the, property, garden. since the property is, I realize that we're talking about a change of ownership, but since there's incredible expertise at the college, and full disclosure, I'm an employee for college. And, um, but the Botanic Garden um, director and staff would have incredible expertise. Would they be consulted about that? So we get, we get information from whoever offers it. Um, so the answer is yes, we'd love to have it. No, I don't think it's a matter of the city having sort of a separate relationship and saying we're automatically going to bring you in. You know, there's obviously a potential conflict between Smith selling it and Botanic Gardens, but we have to take or planning would have to take advice from everybody. Um, I'm wondering if there are some lessons um, that we as a neighborhood and the city at large can take from uh, the Clark School experience and also from the North Street experience. Um, I'm just curious to hear if the city has any thoughts on what, what were lessons good and bad of those development efforts. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, North Street um, was actually one of the, I mentioned this thing about limited development projects. It was one of our failures. We reached out to the neighborhood up front and said, when the property was in the market originally, and said, we'd love to work with you and developers. We'd probably carve off three homes, and we'd only do it if you all would embrace the project. And there was enough people who didn't want anything to happen that we passed on buying the property, uh, and then it began its 10 years saga down the line. Um, and so maybe, you know, the lesson from my standpoint for that is trying to figure out early that those sort of, you know, where's the common ground and, and where is it that's possible to make things happen together. 
Um, Clark School was really more in terms of some of my experience in this project, so we, we weren't involved in the RFP process, but it's more in terms of you know, seeing how that process worked from an institution. Clark was one of those institutions who said, we're not developers, we don't want to get in this business, we don't want to learn this, we don't want to do a detailed study trying to figure out where the best return is because we think we're just, you know, we're not sure we can get it. Um, and in fact, the developer who bought the property went against the rules that every other private developer told us about. They said, there's no way it's going to work there. And the developer just sort of felt like they had a, a role, a model that worked, and it worked for them, and so having done the study up front might not have achieved, you know, might not have gotten that developer anyway. I know that Clark in the beginning was willing to entertain either someone buying the entire property or portions of the property, whichever gave them the greatest return. And then from their standpoint, they figured selling the entire property was the best return for them. And Clark is a little more complicated than this because there are a lot of buildings there. So one of the things that, that Clark had to deal with is after they had a preferred developer, it was a year, a year and a half before they actually closed. This may have a shorter due diligence period, but so is every time. In the, um, in the zoning regulations, is there the capacity to talk, uh, to require reuse and disclosure in certain ways, or is that outside the purview? Reuse of buildings? Reuse of buildings, but also I'm thinking about the faculty housing that I'm imagining those would get um, demolished, and the waste from that um, demolition, is that something that happens as a part of uh, zoning um, and permitting? It could happen as part of zoning. There's a lot of things which could legally happen as part of zoning, which tend, from my standpoint at least, tend to make more sense on a citywide basis. Like, you know, our lands wouldn't have a landfill anymore, but when we had a landfill, they used to take construction and demolition debris, and then they diverted this. If there's a waste of landfill space, it has to go elsewhere. And citywide regulations, to me, make more sense because there's nothing unique about these buildings versus other perfectly good buildings coming down. My own feeling is the same thing about the historic preservation. The comment I made earlier, you know, this, well, maybe it should be a historic district, but if this should be a historic district, this probably should be as well. Um, and the other thing you should know is historic districts don't prevent historic buildings from coming down. They just require more alternative assessments. So they make it a little bit easier to save historic <coughs> buildings. Um, and both easy in terms of, from a regulatory path, it's easier and potentially open up some federal tax credits as well. So those kinds of things I think are good ideas, probably not for the zoning. Yeah, um, at the beginning, you sort of made comments about the cost, the, the, you know, the capital cost of putting the roads in, and it's, it, um, you get the sense that it would be, it's not a very good investment to put in a lot of streets and therefore have higher um, density. Um, but can you speak to the cost of tearing down those buildings? Um, what does it involve? Say I, I were a developer and I wanted to demolish the carriage house or any one of them. What would that, what's in terms of demolishing it? Is yeah, yeah. it very expensive? Is there a lot of different things yeah. you have to go through? I don't have a good sense of numbers. Let me, do, let me do two things. One in terms of streets. The figure we often use is for quick planning purposes and each site's different is a road to back 250, maybe $300 a foot to build. You know, including the infrastructure, including everything that's there. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the developer wouldn't build the roads. I'm just saying it's a balancing act. Sometimes you'll see developers not build the max amount of units you think they could get because the road cost becomes more and more marginal at a certain point. But you certainly see some build roads. I don't know in terms of demo. I mean, for a single family home, the figure I often use is ten to $20,000. 20,000 is the city side because it costs us more, um, and a, a house that has uh, asbestos has to be dated first. Um, 10,000 might be a house, that, you know, is a ranch house that doesn't have asbestos in it. Um, I have no <coughs> idea for bigger buildings where that scales up or not. Asbestos has to be dealt with whether you redo a building or demolish it, and that can be a huge cost. You see buildings, you, know, you all saw this for Cole Morgan. I mean, the old Cole Morgan on King Street. Construction took place in that building for six months before you saw anything on the outside. And that was mostly about uh, asbestos remediation. So I would guess the building this age has asbestos, but I don't really know that. And is there a time period where you have to get public? Um, isn't there some <coughs> thing about when you tear down a house that demolition. you have it, it, some delay? Right. So we have we have demolition delay. It's not very effective for institutional projects. So 
when you tear down a historical building, basically any building before 1940, if it's on our list, anything before 1900, is that right? If it's not on our list, you have to go before a historical commission and get permission to tear it down. And if they say no, they can delay the project for a year. That's very, you know, if you have a house on Columbus, you want to tear it down tomorrow, and you have one buyer who wants to buy it for a brand new house, and one buyer who wants to reuse it, it's incredibly effective. When you have an institutional property like this, a year is nothing. I mean, Smith could tomorrow apply for demolition delay, knowing that if they put this on the market a year from now, the soonest someone would come forward is probably three years before you see someone breaking ground. So demolition delay isn't very effective for a big project with a long lead time. Mm -hmm. I have two questions, one for the college and one for the city. Um, and again, apologies if I missed this or that before I got here. Um, for the college, there was, um, I thought I heard you say that it would be sold as is. So, um, the tree removal that was being done by Lashway, was that, <coughs> was there an explanation for <coughs> what that was? Was that standard maintenance or was that pre-sale maintenance? No, that was purely standard maintenance. Okay. I'm sorry. That and, and a lot of that, I think, was removing, uh, I think we had some, during this October storm a couple of years ago, there were a lot of uh, trees on campus that had fallen down, and I think we had moved some of the stuff off there, and we needed to get it off site, off that site. Oh. So I think some of that was actually not even dealing with trees on site specifically. Some of it was almost like a dump site. That you were yeah, so we use this site currently for composting, for storage. Uh, we use it as a nursery for our botanic gardens. We use it for our recycling. So there, there are a lot of active uses like that. And then the question I had for the city. Was um, do you have a sense of what the horizontal infrastructure investment might be triggered by this? I mean, assuming uh, water, sewer, uh, you know, gas is the city's responsibility. But um, if they develop so many units there, um, I don't know how much they could go into the line and street infrastructure, or how much they go down to the con street. Do you have a sense of what? You know, if we're at capacity in those areas, or if they would trigger um, <coughs> city upgrades, and would they, through the special permit process, be required to fund that and do some of that themselves? I mean, how does that work? Yeah. So infrastructure is all developers' responsibility. I mean, you know, if you're talking economic development, the city might try to get grants, but in terms of housing, it's all developers' responsibility. Those are all exactly the questions we'd ask. You know, the, the on-site stuff is easy. You all know there's a major sanitary trunk line that's behind the site, but I don't know if it has capacity. So, yes, those are all questions that they'd have to look at. Um, Wayne, back to the Clark School. Um, I believe there was quite an active neighborhood group uh, involved in that. Are there any, you know, lessons that you observed that we should know about of how that neighborhood group uh, affected or didn't affect yeah. the planning process? Um, was well, similar, I think, in terms, of, I said, of sort of working with the developer. Most, not all, the majority of the neighborhood, the, you know, Clark's a little different because we're going buildings, and there were some people who wanted nothing to happen on the site whatsoever. The majority of people really wanted something to happen because their biggest fear was demolition. So Clark, a lot of the issues was about historic districts. So we had a, a, a Elm Street historic district, and the neighborhood pretty strongly wanted the historic district to climb up Round Hill. Um, to include the Clark campus. The developer who came forward, their whole scenario was getting federal um, historic preservation tax credits. <coughs> so it was sort of, to some extent, a love fest. The neighborhood wanted historic district. Clark's position was very clear. Clark's was, if the sale falls through, we don't want it. So please, city council, don't pass it till we know the sale wants it. If the sale goes through, the developer who ended up buying it very much wanted it because he wanted the tax credits anyway. So once that sale was clear, that sort of brought everybody together. So there were a few people who still didn't want anything, but I think, and there were certainly issues of how big are that there's um, uh, speed humps to slow down the traffic and so, some traffic mitigation, certainly small issues. But the big picture issue, I think the majority of not all the neighborhood, you know, sort of got what they wanted in the direction. Would a conservation restriction be considered for preserving the non-buildable areas? Uh, some permanent method to preserve the land, yes. Could be coming to the city, could be a conservation restriction, it could be some other method, but keeping that land. You know, particularly, I mean, I think the biggest city interest is this property over mm -hmm. here. We already have some conservation land in the area. And then this direction, the biggest interest is the trail. As a practical matter, 
this is wetlands. It doesn't really matter what we do. They can't do anything. Wait, anyway, along those lines, that was a concern when you first mentioned about the wetlands and uh, that area. My concern in envisioning uh, some future development would be that they might try to cheat for more, more space by filling in some of that lower land. Um, is that something that we could make sure is guarded against? There's no special permitting that you could. Right. Well, the regulations that. are very strict. So th th there's sort of the only. I mean, you can, you can fill tiny bits of wetlands as part of a project and replace them. The only thing where the wetlands law is somewhat liberal is things which can only be in one place. So for example, there is a sewer trunk line, I'm not exactly sure where, probably some of you know more than I do, but somewhere over here. Um, and you can imagine if you're running a sewer line to that, you might have to cross a wetlands. State law is permissive about crossing wetlands to allow a linear thing to be built and then restoring the wetlands afterwards. But in terms of filling for development, yeah, that, that really is. Let's, unless there's, I, I take one last question, I want to start switching to input because I'm getting some indirect input for what you're all saying, and I, and I want to lose in our comments. So back to the the debris and everything that's being stored on the site. When you say as is, does that mean that Smith is no longer going to be removing stuff and we'll be dealing with the developer for that? I mean, it's all got to go, right? So will we be dealing with Smith in the removal or the whoever's developer? Removal of? The removal of everything that's been stored there. I mean, I, oh, I understand well, there's a lot of stuff. Being yeah, yeah. I mean, we would, we would probably pull a lot of that stuff off site. We use a lot of that stuff and then okay. we pull it off site. And we have to develop a plan for how we're going to now store some of the stuff that we have historically been storing there. So yeah, we would continue to act in that capacity. So we'll still work with Smith on the trucks going in. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, just one more comment before you morph into the next section. Um, and pertinent to what Lily was saying, and I think where you're all trying to go with this, I think I think the more relevant example may be the Green Street Arnold Avenue Belmont experience. And um, I'm just going to say it. I think all of you get that there's another nuance to this process. Um, there could be a lot of input um, if Smith were open to hearing it prior to them issuing an RFP for the development of the parcel. I would certainly hope that they would talk to their own botanical folks about protecting the trees that are on site listening to the neighborhood, there are opportunities to stipulate types of housing development, areas for development. Um, with all due respect to the gentleman from Smith, to just put it on our own permitting process, I think is, is a lesson that we have learned not in a great way. Um, the Belmont Avenue neighborhood, all they wanted was not to have a big, huge building plop down in the middle of their neighborhood, and that's exactly what they got. And we did an 18-month public process, at which point the architect was already hired and working parallel to our public process. So we didn't really get anywhere on that one. So I just want to encourage you to maybe, um, there are other ways to pursue this process. It's the one difference there with Smith was the developer. Mm -hmm. so this, Smith they, owns this parcel. Right, what I'm saying is they're, they're selling this parcel to a developer. So the, they're they third party. They can and add some strings. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for all right, so Carol's <coughs> going to take notes. So I, I don't. We can guess from some of the questions you've had concerns about, you know, Bob's comment, a few other people about saving historic buildings, saving special <coughs> trees, um, you know, saving the open space. But I just want to be more. I want to make sure we're not missing anything. So what you know, what are the things that are particularly a concern to you about the site that we shall hear about? I mean, at first is uh, certainly the density of it, but also uh, that it fit in with the neighborhood ex exactly. That's been a big concern of ours public access, public right of ways, that, that it not be a private uh, community, private neighborhood, I think. I don't speak for everyone, but I think there was a lot of people who felt similarly. When you and I met, uh, we also talked about possibly an addition to, to either bike trail or, or path trail going down to Carriage Hill, what you're calling the path, which has always been known as Carriage Hill. So I think along the edge of that wetland area is, is a perfect place for an accessible trail and it actually sounds encouraging if you add sidewalk space on Pleasant Street that uh, it would be more accessible for that possible uh, bit, you know, use to, to have a public access along the border of the property. So for me, that, that's a good one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Something I think about is uh, opportunities that might be provided by a new development. And you mentioned uh, traffic and traffic studies and things like that before and how many trips people make and um, well personally I don't make many trips at all. I work downtown and I walk everywhere. And I'm thinking that there might be an opportunity for a shared um, car 
uh, situation there. So that would reduce the traffic and that might <coughs> reduce the number of cars on the road. Okay. okay. Thank you. I lost my opportunity to ask a question, so I'll phrase it as a statement. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it either way. <laughs> I have no idea whether or not there are. Um, I, I guess I guess it's as far as far as zoning is concerned, zoning that has to do with sustainability as opposed to number of units and fitting in with the neighborhood which is a completely different thing because neighborhoods are not inherently set up to be sustainable since most of them were set up before there was such thing. Um, if there aren't, maybe there should be. And I believe that any process like this that is intended to be long and drawn out could be the excuse for creating a new regime in which developments are intended to be sustainable, which right now they are not, as far as I know. Okay, so you. can I just clarification? What do you mean by sustainable? Okay, uh, if you want to. There's 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 a process called zoning in which you can have so many units and so many feet of frontage. There's another process in which we want it to fit in with the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There could be a process in which that that I I don't think it really exists, so it would have to be developed by the city. But it would be a good idea to have an additional process in which you say. Okay, and is this development sustainable as far as environment, as far as, as far as traffic, not because you don't want to sit in traffic, but because maybe people should drive less? How many? It, is, it would be hypothetically possible, for instance, for there to be an assessment of how many people will live there compared with how many cars they will own and favoring, especially in a downtown area, a development that would have less parking spaces and less people that own less cars. Uh, just to build off that comment, Smith put on its announcement website today that one of its reasons for, um, for wanting to sell this land was to decrease its own carbon footprint as an institution. And so with that sort of goal in mind, one way one might be able to see about developing this property is also thinking about developing in a way that would have a minimal effect on the carbon footprint. And so having something that focuses on energy efficient homes and so forth, building in that idea okay. of sustainability. That could be something that um, could be really win-win in terms of PR between, I think, Smith and the, and the city. And potentially even working some of the open space areas into to conservation restriction. And you only know that the city has what's called the energy stretch code and the city council may be asked to adopt even stricter mm -hmm. ones. So increasingly any new building is being asked to be energy efficient, but obviously you can go further than that. Um, just kind of building on those thoughts, there is um, under the LEED system from the U.S. Green Building Council, there is LEED neighborhood development. And I don't know if that's <coughs> something that we would want to suggest that's, you know, I, don't know, I don't know, but they can stipulate that in a sale payment or somehow influence uh, that, but then that would be one option. There are credits, you know, if you said we want to hit lead neighborhood development silver and you get credits for bike racks and for gray water reuse and, you know, I mean, there are, that's, that's more home than, uh, but yeah, that's maybe one of the things we were aiming towards. Um, I'm, I'm just very aware that to me this is the last uh, you know, relatively large parcel that is so close to downtown and I would hope that the, the city and I would hope that the neighborhood that I live in um, would be excited to take advantage of that fact to make sure that what goes in there could add to the uh, fabric of our downtown, of our of our city. And to that end, I mean, maybe people will look at that in different ways, but do we really need more uh, houses of, the, of, of just the same stock that 
is already in the existing neighborhood? Or do we need something that's a little more innovative that could be affordable for the people who work in downtown Northampton? Or for the elders who want to get rid of their large home and would like to move over the backyard and go into something big? Some of us will age. We have wheelbarrows that we can move with. Um, so, so, like this, this pocket uh, housing, I mean, it's it, in this picture, it's very attractive and it's high density. It's not a pie, it's not an apartment. But it's really, um, and they're only a 1,000 to maybe 2,000 square feet places. And it doesn't mean it would all have to be that. It could be a mixed thing. But I, I would really like to think in terms of, of you know, high density population of, for the start out families, for the working families, for the elderly, so that Perhaps, you know, kind of like our last chance, gasp, to keep some of the flavor and the mixture of Northampton uh, that has, you know, that has made it what it is for the last 50 years. Yeah. You raised a rather important point. I should have mentioned this before. One of the reasons for all those zoning changes the city council just did is, is to address some of those things. You know. One of the discussions we heard from one developer is when you make people have large lofts, and the, way, the only way a developer can get a return is by selling 3,000 square foot units. Um, when you allow smaller lots, you can get a return by selling more of those 1,000 or 1,500 square foot units. It doesn't make them cheap, but at least it brings down the cost. You know, even the cost per square foot is the same, at least in some of them. One of, the, um, one of the pieces that you pointed to in the beginning was this idea of interconnectivity. And um, there are two things. Um, one that you mentioned, which was to the open space, and I, you know, the bike paths and the, the um, connection to Fruit Street and the value of that, so certainly to endorse what others have said about that. But the other thing is the Senior Center was met with some controversy in that it was further out of downtown, and, and yet here we are looking at something that in fact abuts the backside of the Senior Center. Um, so I think to echo what are the ways in which we can build something that speaks uh, that fits with the neighborhood that honors some of these things about sustainability but also really looks at what's what what are the pieces of connection with stuff that already exists downtown as a monolithic thing um, open space as another but the senior center um, as a third yeah. so. okay. I'm going to uh, stand up for the faculty apartments. Three <laughs> counts. One, I, I suspect that they're architecturally rather more significant than we're used to thinking of with their 17th century homes. And second, I, I think they're very um, discreet in terms of their impact on the neighborhood. So when you're thinking about what might go into that land, you know, it's not a bad model for something that is compact, uh, has a lot of fairly you know, dense you know, units in it, and it's not an eyesore. Believe me, I'm, 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 I have mixed feelings about my own. If you read Historic Preservation magazine, that's the era that people were looking at now. But I'll, I'll leave that aside. I mean, it's, it's not something, I, I doubt that more than like 5% of Northampton's population even knows that those apartments are there. It's close to Salvo House. So my third point is um, I would really like not to have three or four story buildings there. And I, I know that the city's zoning is more and more encouraging that. But it is a site that as you drive into town, if there was some huge tower there, um, it, not to go back to the other Smith experience, just so it's clear in terms of city encouraging, so the city's allowed tall buildings for a long time. In fact, we allowed smaller lot size per unit when you had tall buildings. So this was in some ways equalize the playing field. This was to say we not trying to prohibit those buildings, but we're trying to encourage density and other capacity. Part of the reason that 
single family homes now only require 50 feet of frontage, is to say, if you were to do, if you were to do density, it doesn't have to be multifamily. We, we, we embrace all kinds of densities out there. I have, I have a, a three-story iron building in the backyard. And uh, I, I don't want to go into how that ever happened, but you know, that's the kind of thing that really has a severe impact on, on neighboring lots in terms of light, um, sheer aesthetics. It is worth yeah, noting yeah. that many of the homes, though, are three stories yeah. already in the neighborhood. There are six stories. Six exactly. Stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, I can picture there being two-story apartment buildings, not a huge number of them in there, that would be really attractive and would leave the, the, that space feeling like the campus with big trees and other there isn't some list circulating, and the most important reason for the list is if you want us to have your email so we can notify you for future meetings. So if you haven't you signed ask up. For email. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone could just put their name and address. Oh, 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 I'm interested in a buffer zone between as an abutter and, you know, it's been open space, <coughs> not a lot of activity back there. And so some sort of buffer zone between existing houses and whatever. Development happens there. Okay, good. Thank you. I wanted to second Mark's comment about uh, lean reordered development, as I think right now the best model for evaluating and standardizing our practices. And I think there's a lot of municipalities that have like used that as a zoning tool or as a regulatory tool. So I'd advocate for that on the neighborhood scope for whole development, um, but then also you use something like uh, net zero as a threshold. For which this this place should be sort of held to a higher standard uh, because of the opportunity for it and the opportunity to get. Yeah, um, my is for input. My biggest fear really is already happening between eight and eight thirty in the morning. We have a bunch of cars that run down Monroe Street and into the school. And they have no real, they're not part of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They're just dropping their kids off. And I'm at this, at the uh, the intersection there. And they typically, um, I think they've been told to, to do the loop, go down Monroe, and then come out Lyman. And um, they go very, they go fairly fast, and they don't really have any, um, you know, they're not part of the neighborhood, per se. And I think some of those, you know, um, street maps that you sort of crayoned in. I worry about that, is that there's people that'll take a loop that, you know, all they're doing is trying to get to their, to their house in the fastest way, and then it'll, it'll sort of ruin the, um, the nature of the streets where people are just, you know, driving to their house and going slowly and they're part of the neighborhood. Okay. Thanks. I just want to make sure we get some list about uh, Adaptive reuse on a separate parcel of the two historic structures on the property there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> I was noting what Susan said. There actually is one other large property close to downtown. It's the Leah Honda property. So I know this is a question, but can you assure us that there aren't any toxic spills that a developer wouldn't want to clean up on this property? Which is no, I, mean, I assume that most developers are going to do their own due diligence as part of the process. So. Well, that's what's prevented the Leah Honda property from being developed for the past 20 years, is that there's a toxic spill under the pavement, and so they can't do anything without spending millions of dollars on that? I think, I think Leah Honda is probably more complicated than that. I, I think if the numbers work, that site would get developed. But I, don't, I mean, I don't know what's here. That's going to be part of a due diligence process. And there's been years of, of different things, and that's been a big concern of mine is any potential remediation. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't have the railroad history that yeah. Leah Honda has, so it's a lower risk site, but yes, anyone's going to look at that process. Other questions, comments? Is there, is there precedent, not necessarily in Northampton, but in the world of planning and zoning, um, that communities can make a showcase of something that says, you know, we we we're gonna we have stretch code, we're, but we're gonna reach further here. We have uh, uh, impending EPA stormwater regulations, but we're gonna reach further here. I understand that in this moment, 
Smith owns it and the city is midwifing something. Um, but is there is there a precedent for cities saying, like, we'd like to showcase sort of our ability to get lots of uh, different kinds of incomes, um, really think very forward about transportation, about water use, about building materials. Is that... Is yeah, it's sort of doable. I think there's a couple of answers. One is cities, I mean, it's usually not done just through regulations. It usually becomes investment. You know, often some of the best examples are, are surplus properties that cities have um, for doing it. Uh, and then Massachusetts code limits us in some ways. So, for example, in Massachusetts, we don't have the right to adopt a local building code. So, Massachusetts says you can have a building code or you can have a stretch code, but we don't get to write a code. Um, for doing so, there's some areas we can be stricter. We do have stormwater regulations, um, but we have to have some. We have to treat everybody fairly. You know, we can't say this 31 acres is going to have one set of regulations and a different set of regulations apply somewhere else. But Smith could David set an RFP that said we value. Uh, uh, understand it's a more complicated equation perhaps but an RFP could say we would prioritize an emphasis on sustainable development an emphasis on really progressive water management and transportation and um, that kind of thing that's within the the realm of an RFP so what is an RFP okay. and of course the city can incentivize it I mean going back to the comment about you know getting homes where fewer people drive you know, one of the biggest costs for the site is going to be traffic and traffic mitigation. You know, I, I think the neighborhood is probably going to be somewhat <coughs> dubious about proposals, but you can imagine developers saying, well, I'm doing a proposal and I really do think people are going to have one car per unit or 0.8 cars per unit instead of 2.2 cars per unit. Uh, and I can generate less trips, and then the incentive will be they're not doing traffic mitigation. The problem, you, you know, we had this with, um, uh, next year, okay. Uh, Bear, Hill. Bear Hill. Bear Hill said, we're age restricted, we're 55 and above, nobody, you know, they're all retired. And then, of course, they're all 55 and they're all working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so, in theory, those soft solutions are absolutely wonderful. We're always, you know, I, I, I hate being a skeptic, but we're always a little bit skeptical about those. But we certainly incentives are a great way to get those things. But I think the other piece, too, is you all have been talking about these um, different aspects of it, some of which are already in the zoning to sort of, that may even be better than a, a lead neighborhood standard because we require connectivity, we require um, pedestrian and bicycle facilities in the zoning. So there are bits and pieces that are required and the fact that it is so close to downtown, so if we require <coughs> connectivity via pedestrian or bicycle from this site to downtown, necessarily you could get points elsewhere, but those things are already built in. And there are other things that we're actually working on in terms of subdivision regulations to create more um, environmentally friendly street systems or requirements for building streets. That, um, so we've <coughs> talked about shared streets, so we have maybe less infrastructure, less pavement. And um, you know, if we have less pavement and narrower pavement, people are walking and um, driving in the same, on the same piece of infrastructure that's necessarily going to be slower. And so the ways that we can build into the regulations that sort of force someone in that direction without really saying we're going to call this lot out in particular and say you have to meet you know this other standard <coughs> we can apply it across the board. It, just as an example, I think LEED is a wonderful standard, but you know our energy commission says LEED is great, but what we really care about is the energy side. And I suspect our stormwater planner at DPW would say, lead is great, what we really care about is the stormwater. And <laughs> I might say, you know, the best way for sustainability is maximizing the people who can walk downtown. So I, we may want to, as a community, have those discussions in detail and not leave it to someone far away to create the standard. It's a great standard because it's there and it's generally pretty good. Um, something along those lines is, and I'm not sure how, or if it's been extrapolated over multiple buildings, but there's something called the Living Building Challenge, which, um, not to <coughs> not to undermine LEED, but it kind of looks at LEED and, and, and almost equates that to like the, um, co co the carbon credits that it says, oh, LEED is, is meant well, but you have credits and you can choose them. You can do this right and do that wrong. And the Living Building Challenge says, we're gonna do everything right. 
we're going to exceed all those standards. We're going to do the best we can in, in every aspect of the project. So that might be something to look at the moving building challenge. Susan was mentioning about the, uh, this kind of ties in with it. Uh, we were talking with Devin Bruce. She was suggesting that we be involved with, and I was going to ask if this was the opportunity for us to be involved in the special yeah. permitting process, the special permitting review, as far as fine tuning some of those last pieces the, to the zoning that you folks haven't yet finished. Do you yeah, see I this mean, as a. So that's going to help, you know, we want a discussion about this site in particular because this is all in most of your backyards and your incident, but in some way, the way this is informing us is the special permit criteria, which are not going to just affect the site. You know, special permit affects sites all over the urban right. sections. That's what she was saying. So. Um, but these are sort of, you know, Carolyn's idea was we look at a few particular parcels. So this is our example of the biggest parcel. Shaw's Motel is the example of the other end of a much more urban parcel. And so we're sort of going to take our special permit criteria for a test run and think about each of these parcels. But this is certainly the biggest parcel in the urban area we're going to get short of some calamity wiping out parts of the city. So, you know, it, we need to make sure it works here and works in Shaw's and works other places. So you encourage us as a neighborhood to, to possibly be part of that process? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's be a very public process going forward. Other comments, thoughts? Yeah, just I'd like to just add to that list. I don't think it was mentioned, but um, so the path to Cruise Street has been talked a lot, but there's also another path that actually goes on top of the dike Because of the existing road that went around the whole property. So it's kind of gotten down to a little path. David, this had to do with, um, I, I was just, if I may, just quote something. I'm stealing it from Ira Brick from the Safe Cushman Group, who was quoting A.S. Neal, who was a founder of the Summerhill Schools in, uh, in England, who dealt a lot with freedom versus license issues. And I just kind of wanted to, to remind Smith, and I thank you folks are trying to be responsible and I appreciate the fact that you are part of this process so that you are engaging us. But um, the private property owners have a right to do whatever they want versus the need to sort of subsume themselves to the public good in involving us in, in kind of that your responsibility as well as to your shareholders is also to doing, at least doing, doing good for the community, not just the neighborhood, but the whole city. And I think we've, we've kind of cussed, not covered that, but. So I, I just want to tell you where we're going so you can keep in touch if you want. So the, the special permit criteria, so there's sort of three things going forward, just so you all know. One is working the special permit criteria. Again, the goal is to go through the public process and get them to city council in time for city council to adopt it sometime by the end of June. So that's probably the, the most time critical path in this process. The second is we have a criteria in our zoning right now which says any project with 10 or more units and planning board is going to suggest reducing it to seven units. But any project by that size, the infrastructure has to be designed as subdivision standards. Subdivision is generally about sort of more rural, new streets. Um, but we're going to play, we're working on this, revising the subdivision regulations. So Carol and I talked about the shared streets, where maybe instead of sidewalks, we narrow the streets as a smaller environmental footprint. Cars go slower, you get safety by cars going slower instead of trying to separate them. The subdivision standards will be going forward. Those where the zoning is adopted by planning by city council, subdivision regulations are adopted by planning board, but they still be doing a public hearing for that. Um, and then the third, which is more nebulous, is we're continue to work with neighborhood and Smith College over the next one to ten years before this project moves forward. We don't really know what the time period is, but there's different ways to inform developers. One's the obvious of regulations. But the other is just the more clear there's a community consensus. You know, developers want the easiest way to get a permit. They don't necessarily want the no greatest number of units. They want the easiest way to get a permit. And so the more we can reach a consensus as a community, or the closest thing as possible a consensus, and form developers that you're more likely to get a permit in this way, that's a useful process. No guarantees in that round, but that's useful. Um, are these maps available? Uh, I'll post it on our website. They're not yet, but I'll post it okay. on our website. Thank you. Uh, uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing, I didn't want to pass it out, but I didn't want what we were thinking as a brainstorming to set the stage. 
Um, so this is just sort of a special permit criteria based on what staff has brainstormed with the planning board. Um, they're sort of take homes, feel free to email. These are not, these don't, obviously don't reflect all your comments. So this isn't designed to think here's where we're going, but just sort of give ideas and, and depart from here. So just take one and pass around. And, <coughs> and I'll post these on our website as well. The notes for this meeting, can you send them out? Uh, you can send them out on our website, whatever's easiest. Um, we can, I mean, either way, we can post our website quickly. Sending them out is basically once the intern types up all your email addresses. <laughs> so where, where on the website? I mean, is there going to be a special um, yeah, We've just got a new website. So it's northamptonma.gov slash plan. And um, we have a thing that's called, maybe small, small lots, big ideas? Yeah. We have a section called small lots, big ideas. Oh, yeah. um, right now it's tailored around some other projects we did, but I'll create a section there. So give me a couple days before it's Big lot, big idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big lot, big idea. So those notes will include all of these? Yeah, yeah. Wait, Brian, you want to last word? Um, well, I, I would just say that um, this is obviously, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a private development, but it's happening in a most public of context, and that's exactly why you elect local uh, representative. So uh, <laughs> Councilor Sharon and I and Councilor Dwight uh, are here to have a few resources for you. Please be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.